I am so convinced about the validity of my findings. It's not about Jacques Gautier, it's about the issue of the legal title to Jerusalem. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things I have to deal with often is this, this question, but uh, Dr. Gautier, why are you t telling us about legal findings? Don't you understand that this is a political matter? Do you, have you not grasped the realities? And um, we have some difficulty uh, present, presenting counter uh, arguments when we look at your heavy thing, but uh, who cares? This is about politics. My response to that is, wait a minute. The Secretary General of the United Nations and many of the member nations constantly declare that uh, Jewish people in at least parts of Jerusalem, are there illegally, they're trespassers, they're wrongdoers, they're thieves. And as one who's practiced law over 39 years, I, I should say to you that, that that has a legal implication. If they have no rights, then perhaps they're trespassers, perhaps they're thieves, but if in fact, at some point in time in history, the rights have been given to them, then perhaps that they're as of right and they're not thieves. And, and the word settlement should not be used in such a negative connotation in respect to those who live in part of Jerusalem. When I started my work, I must tell you, I had no idea, I had no idea that it would take this long. I, I wasn't planning to work on this for over 20 years. Um, what happened to me along the way, because this was a doctoral thesis at the University of Geneva Graduate Institute of International Studies. I had as an initial director a, a, a marvelous, uh, very, very highly regarded professor of international law, Lucius Caflisch, who was then appointed to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and said, someone else must take over the, the ongoing uh, supervision of your work. And he introduced me to Marcelo Cohen with a K. Originally from Argentina, speaks and writes in five <coughs> languages. His thesis, a marvelous um, academic work uh, on, on issues of sovereignty, not specifically relating to the Middle East, but uh, won the Guggenheim Prize. And, and uh, Professor Cohen, when he first met me, said, you know, um, a lot of people have sentiments, opinions, and views relating to the, the issue of Jerusalem, and I don't care about those. If you are prepared to work with me as a scientist, if you are prepared to, to approach this in a scholarly way, and never give me a draft chapter without supporting every single page uh, with, uh, with solid, solid evidence that what you're saying is, 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 is well-founded, then we won't work together. We did work together, and because of him, it took much longer. And because of him, there are now 3,200 footnotes in here. Without him and a friendly supervisor, it might have been like this. You know, I look at the thesis of Theodore Herzl. He got a doctorate for his work. It's only about 80 pages. It's not fair. Look what I had to do for mine. And uh, so today, I, I look back and. It was grueling, it was demanding, it was challenging, but I'm thankful because I had to go into every nook and cranny of the history, try to understand the, the foundations of the, of the Muslim claims, of the, of, the, of the Christian claims, and of course of the Jewish claims. Uh, if you try to summarize the connection between the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem, it's not easy. Try to do it in less than 5,000 pages. It's very hard. I had to do it in less than 200 pages. Otherwise, this would not be a legal thesis. So I had to learn to do executive summaries. Present, for instance, the connection between Jerusalem and the Jewish people, biblically, from the Book of Psalms, in one page. Try it. It takes a long time to do executive summaries. The foundations are here. What I'm interested in is the answer to the question, has 
in a moment of history, is there a situation that took place where title was given under international law to one party or another? Is it possible as a jurist, as an international lawyer, to make the statement that the issue of sovereignty has already been dealt with and decided? My conclusion is that it is chose jugé. It is res judicata. The decisions have been made. There was a moment in history when presentations were made. Documents in Canada, we would call them a statement of claim. When you go to court, you present a statement of what you want to the judge or judges. Your statement of claim is not a source of obligations and rights, but the decision made by the judge or judges when they hear your case is indeed binding. Did that happen? So the pursuit of the answer was like putting together a 10,000 piece puzzle. For those of you who do puzzles, it takes a long time when you got so many pieces for an image to appear. You know, you get little things here and there. But the image doesn't come out until you put the key pieces of the puzzle together. The truth is, I didn't know the answer when I commenced my work. I did not set out to establish that the Jewish people or the Palestinians had title. I didn't know if such an event had taken place. The approach that I want to take is, is this. And this is what I do as I speak about this issue in various parliaments around the world. And uh, I've been told repeatedly that uh, in places, whether it's uh, the parliament in Brussels or um, Columbia University in New York, just, just for the next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, that uh, I, I might encounter some hostility, I might uh, face some real opposition, but the truth is, what I want to do with you, whoever you are, is talk to you, uh, to you about a matter that involves justice. I'm appealing to people of conscience. I want you to listen to the facts. Because when you pass judgment, if you've got half the facts, or you have the wrong facts, then it's likely that your decision is not going to be the right one. So come with me. Allow me to present to you the pertinent facts relating to the issue of sovereignty over Jerusalem, and more specifically, the old city of Jerusalem. What's fascinating is when I present the initial part of uh, my findings, um, I talk about the Green Line and how it's become so relevant in, in, in whatever is declared around the world. And uh, my hope is that I can convey to those who are listening to me what the meaning of the Green Line is. It's considered sacred. It's considered the real dividing source of rights and obligations between the Jewish state and perhaps a future Palestinian state. If you look at many documents and, and maps, you will see that the, the Green Line is associated with, with uh, Jordan. and. Um, here, the blue line is, is associated with Israel. Please work. You see the, the green line around the old city here. And uh, what I point out is this. The green line is nothing but the armistice line resulting from the agreement between Jordan and Israel in 1949. In international law, there's a book that deals with the law of war. And there's a book that deals with issues of sovereignty. In respect to the law of war, the desire of those who are preoccupied with these issues is to encourage those who are killing each other and fighting to stop fighting. And that's why you have an armistice agreement. And in that agreement, certain lines are drawn. And you're told, if you agree to stop fighting and the lines are thus and thus, do not be concerned about the implications from the point of view of entitlement to sovereignty. 
political claims. Look at Article 2. It specifies that in no way should the, this line uh, prejudice the rights, claims, and positions of the parties. So when I explain this and note that in so many contexts, in so many documents and resolutions of the United Nations, the Green Line is used in respect to the proposed partition of, of Jerusalem. I explain that, you see, what would in fact happen if you did that? Is that the dark green would be the, 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 the Palestinian capital, the, the, the remnant of Jerusalem, and the dark blue would be the, the Israeli um, uh, Jerusalem, and the light green is the, the, the Palestinian state surrounding what's left of Jewish Jerusalem. And then I talk about the old city. What is so misunderstood is the significance of the old city. You live here. You assume that everybody understands that when you're referring to the old city, you're referring to the wall city. What I find is a reference to the old city is interpreted to mean all of Jerusalem, which is an old place. It's not often understood that it is the wall city. So when the old city. So when I explain that by using the green line, the entirety of the old city of Jerusalem would be part of the Palestinian capital, they're surprised. The claims you're familiar with. Israel is taking the position that it should retain sovereignty over the entirety of Jerusalem. The Palestinian position, at least officially, is that all of so-called Arab East Jerusalem should be part of, uh, or should become their capital. If you're speaking for Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, many others, all of Jerusalem, in fact, the entirety of, of Western Palestine should, as it was in the documents that I'm going to present to you, should be under sovereignty of the Palestinians. Why am I focus on the old city in two minutes? If you look at the old city, it resembles, it's not exactly the same, but it's pretty close to the way Jerusalem was before it was destroyed in the first century. In fact, if you look at the Roman city built uh, around 135 AD, again, there are lots of similarities between what you see here and the walled city of Jerusalem today. In fact, here's a, a, a collect maps and lithographs, and here's a depiction of Jerusalem in the 12th century. Here's a middle of the 19th century lithograph, and I've got a bunch of those. Jerusalem is the old city. Here's a French map, 19th uh, century. There's nothing outside the walls. Here's a picture of Jerusalem in the early 20th century, about 1930. What's my point? In the minds of those who have written books and articles, who have presented uh, arguments here, there, and everywhere, the, the Jerusalem that matters, the one that was there for almost 20 centuries, is the old city. So when we talk about dividing Jerusalem, that's the reality. And when you start your argument by saying that all divisions must be pursuant to the green line, the ramifications are very significant. I will start my analysis of legal title with Herzl. I mention him because what he did was significant, was extremely significant. His thesis is, uh, is a cornerstone in many ways. But remember, this is the beginning of my legal analysis. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because it's talking about a Jewish state. When so many questions are raised later about what it is that the Zionist organization was really trying to establish, let's begin with this. Incidentally, um, what made him so special was what he did a year later in Basel, Switzerland. Talk about miracles. He managed to unite 197 Jewish people in one place. One of the great challenges facing 
those who are fighting for the, the status of Jerusalem is the extent to which there's a lack of understanding of the rights that I'm going to describe to you in a few minutes and the extent to which there is disunity among the Jewish people. At a time when there's such a consensus internationally, at a time when the nations are singing the same song more and more, and the marketing machinery of the Palestinians has never worked any better. It's frightening to see the extent to which there, there isn't much unity within Israel, around the world, in the Jewish communities. My hope is that there can be unity, at least in respect to what I'm presenting. I believe that there is so much legitimacy, there's so much soundness to the roots of title, that at the very least, and I realize that it's very difficult to extricate law from politics. In fact, when I read articles and books, and have I ever read a lot of those, relating to this issue, the blurring between politics and law is constant. So what we need to do is just extricate this. All I want you to do today is think about the legal dimension. And if you believe that the arguments are sound, then we can all agree in that regard. The thesis, he's presenting, if you look at the subtitle, a modern solution to the Jewish question. I, I thought his arguments were are well, well, well put together, but uh, not as impressive as, uh, uh, as what I found in Rome and Jerusalem by Moses Hess. What a wonderful presentation of that solution. Here's words from Moses says, what we have to do at present for the generation of the Jewish nation is first to keep alive the hope of the political rebirth of our people and next to reawaken the hope where it slumbers. Where, when political conditions in the Orient shape themselves as to permit the organization of a beginning of the restoration of a Jewish state. I, I could go on. He is so articulate. He explains so well the reason why that's a good solution. I also like uh, Otto Emancipation Pins Pinsker, who I won't quote from him because of time limitations, but he says it so well. They weren't the only ones proposing solutions to the Jewish problem. There were many solutions put forward. Lev Davidovich Bernstein had a solution. The solution for the Jewish people and their problems is for them to lose their identity. Oh, by the way, his other name is Leon Trotsky. Perfect assimilation, as far as he was concerned, was the solution. Let's erase any, any trace of Jewishness from people around the world, and then we won't have any problems anymore. He tried very hard, but they still found out that he was Jewish. He ended up being assassinated. You know the story. So. Here's a solution. The difference between him and Hess and Pinsker is what he did in Basel. He put together a gathering of leaders from different parts of the world, principally Europe, and came out with a program. In that program, it was clear that uh, the, the aim was to establish a, a, a safe place, a home for the Jewish people in Palestine. That's noted there. That was the beginning of the movement. It takes us to London. It takes us to, to the Balfour Declaration. Of course, Herzl died. The, the heavy work was picked up by Wiseman and others. Chaim Wiseman, for me, is properly referred to in many of the articles I, I read as the, the father of modern, Jew, of modern Israel. He did so much. Very, very gifted man, scientist diplomat. He, he had a combination of gifts which made a huge difference. His relationship with Balfour, with Lloyd George, with many key players in London did play a role in, 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 in the Balfour Declaration being issued. The Balfour Declaration, incidentally, was not a declaration of a man. It was the British War Cabinet 
that made that declaration. What is fascinating when I, I read about the legal aspects of this issue is how often it is referred to as a source of rights and obligations for the Jewish people. It's not. It is the declaration of one state that did not even possess the territory in 1917. They were fighting the Turks. They were fighting the Turks and did not have legally the power of disposition, the authority to give to anyone. I cannot give your house, Adam, apartment, car, to somebody else because I don't own it. They did not have title. So at what point in time did a body of, of, of judicial officials or, or, or leaders have that authority? The turning point, as far as the legal question, is the Paris Peace Conference. For six months, the victorious allies met at the Quai d'Orsay in Paris. The Quai d'Orsay is the foreign affairs uh, center for, for the French government. That's the way it was in many, many years ago. That's the way it is today. I took the picture. It hasn't changed much. <coughs> The Arabs presented their claim in Paris in February of 1919, and so did the Zionist organization. To understand my legal arguments, we have to go back to the significance of what happened there. Five nations referred to as the principal allied powers and the leaders referred to as the Supreme Council of the principal allied powers sat at a gigantic U-shaped table and deliberated after hearing submissions on the future status of the territories of the nations that lost the war. Okay. The Supreme Council, five nations, the United States, the UK, Japan, France, and Italy. Why are these five nations so significant? You see four leaders here because Japan was often excluded from the proceedings, but the key individuals at the time were Lloyd George, Orlando of Italy, Clemenceau of France, and Wilson of the United States. When the Arab delegation led by Faisal made its presentation in Paris asking for territorial independence in respect of a large segment of the former Ottoman territories, it was presented to these leaders. When the Zionist organization, again in February of 1919, presented its claim, it was <coughs> in the same place. When we talk about the Jewish claim and presentation, I've attached to my thesis an incredibly good article by Harry Sasher who was an advisor to Wiseman, who gives the blueprint, in this day and age we call it a roadmap, of what the Jewish people wanted. Please remember that in 1920, there were only about 70, 80,000 Jewish people living in Palestine, compared to maybe seven or 800,000 Arabs. The, 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 the aim was not to establish a Jewish state right away. The strategy was this, let us appoint a friendly, respected nation as trustee or mandatory to help us while we, uh, the, through the process of immigration, attain a majority in that land and then will de declare independence. That was the game plan. It would have been foolish, although some of the Jewish leaders were advocating immediate statehood, it would have been a foolish thing to do, to do it earlier. Wiseman was the leader of the delegation in Paris. And uh, I want you to note the essential terms of the claim that was presented. Two things. In the claim, remember I referred to a statement of claim, there's a request for recognition, a request for acceptance from those who have the power of disposition of the historical connection of the Jewish people to the land, to Palestine. A request for this. 
It's fascinating for me how, uh, to, to see how often in this day and age I still see different groupings uh, asking for this recognition when that's what happened in Paris. The question is, was it given? Was the answer yes? Was there a positive response? Then look at this. Really crucial. When the Balfour Declaration was drafted, there were many attempts to introduce wording in the Declaration about the reconstitution of what the Jews used to have in that land. Huge opposition. Because people would say, if we give them those terms, can you imagine? That means we have to look historically at everything they used to have. And you did have a few things in Jerusalem, if I remember correctly, for thousands of years, including a couple of temples. Can you imagine if the principle of reconstitution is accepted, what it would mean legally? So it was blocked and it did not appear in the Balfour Declaration. In Paris, Wiseman is asking for this. We want recognition of our historical rights and connections. We want the right to reconstitute. Please, it's a good time for you to ask yourself the question, was that ever recognized? Did they ever say yes to that? We continue. With this, it was a map. And um, if uh, we can go to the next slide. Pro provided, this is my rendition of the map, the, the request or the submission was for land on both sides of the Jordan River. And if we look at the next slide, which was significant because it, it comprised biblically relevant land. We know that there were two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan River, and the land that was requested in Paris covered everything that was bi biblically relevant. What happened? Let's continue. You have to understand that uh, at the beginning of the conference, a document was presented to the Allies, referred to as the Covenant of the League of Nations. The one who inspired this revolutionary document was Wilson. Wilson, having noted the calamities resulting from this great war, the First World War, thought it's time for us to introduce principles that will make things different for mankind. And one of them had to do with this principle of self-determination. So it's important for you to note that it's in those days, early 20th century, that that concept came to life, not as a legal principle, but as a political concept. The Covenant of the League of Nations. Interesting term, covenant. I believe you're familiar with the term covenant. That did not appear initially in biblical days and in the Hebrew Bible. So the nation are just make, not making an agreement. This is a covenant. They want a covenant with each other about certain things to prevent the reoccurrence of the horrible things that happened during that war. It was in that context that Article 22 was introduced. In that article, and this is one of the four corners of my argument, please note Article 22 is introduced this idea that in certain territories, instead of simply grabbing and taking over the land, the Allies are going to put up a system called a mandate system whereby the well-being and development of certain peoples will become a sacred trust of a civilization. I'm here to tell you today that that principle is still relevant in respect to the determination of the status of Jerusalem and the status of the so-called disputed ter territories. It's still relevant. It's a trust of the nations. It's a sacred trust of civilization. It's still relevant. I'll come back to that. Just to explain to you, to give support for my argument about the receipt of title and the giving of title. Look what happens in one of the treaties signed in Paris as a result of what was going on. In this case, Bulgaria, a loser in the war, is assigning title to five nations, the principal allied powers. 
The allies I, I mentioned, but who gets title? These five nations. Very relevant from a legal perspective. Next, the Treaty of Versailles. You know, it's, it's interesting. People tell me when I, I mention the, the Quai d'Orsay, but no, no, the peace talks were in Versailles. No, no. The, the treaty with the Germans was, was signed in the palatial environment of Versailles, but uh, the deliberations were at the Quai d'Orsay. Who gets the German territories under the Treaty of Versailles? The principal allied associated powers, the five. We keep going. Treaty of Trianon. I want you to understand the significance of these treaties. Again, five nations, Hungary is giving up title to territory. To whom? The five nations. How did they do it in the old days? How did they do it in the 17th century? If you conquered a land, if you defeated someone, you just took title. And under international law, that worked. Things changed at the beginning of the 20th century. They didn't change that much if you lost the war, because in the old days, you'd lose the territory. In the new days, you lost the territory. So you still lost your territory. But in this case, it went to five nations instead of one. Next. Look at what happened to Europe as a result of the decisions of the five nations. Territories transferred away from Germany, Austria, Russia, and, and, and this is solid support for my contention that title was given to the principal Allied powers, and with their powers, they conveyed territory or seized territory. Next. That's Europe. Now, we talked about the submissions of, of uh, the Zionist organization, the Arabs, at the Quai d'Orsay. What was the decision of the Allies at the Quai d'Orsay in respect to the Ottoman territories? Well, you know what happened? After six months, they had so many problems. The Americans, uh, there was a lot of strife between the Republicans and the Democrats in, in, in Washington, which was a tragedy, a calamity for the world, because as a result uh, of, the, of the tensions and the frictions there, the Americans never became members of the League of Nations, and, and a, a thousand problems resulted from that. But they had to make decisions regarding the Ottoman territories. They had to deliberate and, 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 and respond. What happens? I take you to La Conférence à San Remo, the San Remo Conference. There is a villa in this beautiful spot in southern Italy, right next to Monaco. And I tell you it's beautiful because I've been there. And uh, in that villa, the Supreme Council gathered not to hear any more submissions, but to deliberate and make decisions. They spent a week there, and two out of the seven days were devoted to the issue of what to do with the Ottoman territories, April 24, April 25 of 1920. Arab people, Jewish people, should never forget the date, April 25 of 1920. What happened? Here's a front page of a newspaper in May of 1920. And you know what happened? I realized the significance of this. And as a result of research here and there, I found the minutes of what happened on the 24th and 25th, which are attached to my thesis. It's such a crucial moment of history. I found that this villa was now a luxury condo, and someone was offering to lease an apartment within the villa for an attractive price. And, and so I, I decided to drive from Geneva with my wife and one of our daughters, and we stayed there for several days. While I was there, I was invited by a lady who had heard I was doing work relating to the villa, and she invited me for tea. She was in her late 80s. She was an old lady, and, and she was all excited that, that someone would pay attention to her property. And as we were having tea, she gave me an envelope filled with pictures in respect to that conference. You know, when you do this work for so long, amazing things happen along the way. Here's one of the pictures. 
After a while, it, I was able to put names on the people sitting at the table. The leading nations were there. You know what's interesting? The Japanese were there. And when I was asked to speak in front of the Japanese parliament last year, I, I brought these pictures because they were a little skeptical. It was amazing to talk to the Japanese uh, leaders because, you know, they don't have great memories about the last war. And I was saying, do you realize what you were involved in in San Remo? You were there, and you helped to give rights to the Jewish people, and you helped to, to give rights to, uh, to the Arabs. It was a key moment, and you did good things. Eyes like this, smiles on their faces. The ambassador, uh, Shitri of Israel, was there. It was fascinating because four days later he was flying to Israel with the Japanese foreign minister and he told me later, boy, did we have something to talk about. And, and I'll tell you a story in a moment about difficulty in finding documents in archives. But by the time I made my presentation, somebody came with a stack of documents like this in Japanese and he said, we checked you out. It's true, we were there. <laughs> and I have it at home in Japanese. If anybody wants to translate them or interpret them, uh, I'll make them available. I have not done that. The next slide. Again, that's the Supreme Council deliberating. I, I, one slide, I, I, I did a circle around the Japanese uh, representatives just for them in case they didn't believe me. And here they are in front of the steps. Next. Why am I so excited about this, the, these events in San Remo? Because this time, we're not talking about the situation of Great Britain in 1917. This time, we're talking about the nations that actually have taken possession, control, have conquered the area of Palestine, and have fully, fully d decided that they're going to decide what's going to happen next with those territories. And what did they decide? They passed the resolution whereby the principles and policies of the Balfour Declaration are to be incorporated in international law, to be part of the treaty with Turkey, they adopt that policy. They make the decision. At the same time, they decide that the Arabs should have a humongous part of the Ottoman territories, the area of Mesopotamia, of Syria, of Lebanon. Now, there are times when I, I present this, and I can tell that my audience is a little dubious. Dr. Gautier, are you not getting a little bit carried away? Is, is this not a slight exaggeration? Are you sure about the importance of this event? That's when I go back to my friend, Haim Weisman, and I, I quote him. The San Remo decision has come. That recognition of our rights in Palestine is embodied in a treaty with Turkey, the Treaty of Sev, and has become part of international law. This is the most momentous political event in the whole history of our movement. And perhaps no exaggeration to say in the whole history of our people since the exile. He was there. He was at the conference. And that's what he says. Next. A treaty was signed a few months later, the month of August, between the Turks, and in this case it's four out of the five, because the United States never declared war against Turkey. So they didn't sign this treaty but they signed documentations relating to that after. And you'll note in Article 95 that all the, the pith and substance of what was decided in San Remo is incorporated in the treaty. However, signed by Turkey later on, this treaty wasn't ratified by the, the parliament. Nevertheless, it's a signed legal instrument clearly conveying what the principal powers had in mind in respect to the rights of the Jewish people in, in regard to Palestine. Next. Look at what happens after St. Remo. The French and the British, the two key powers among the five, go home and draft treaties. Okay? You look at the Book of International Law, and, and there's a list of what is the source of rights and, and obligations for nations under the law of nations. One of the sources is an international treaty. Three treaties are prepared one relating to Syria and Lebanon, and I stress, look at the, what's in red here, who are the beneficiaries of that treaty, of that mandate, the inhabitants, clearly. Next, you look at the similar treaty relating to Iraq, Mesopotamia, who are to be 
And these are right out of the decisions of St. Remo. Now there's a treaty that's supposed to codify, to reflect what was decided. The inhabitants are supposed to be the beneficiaries. Look at what's in red. Next. Now I take you to the key provision of article of uh, the Mandate for Palestine, Article 2. No reference here in the same context to the inhabitants except for the recognition of, of the safeguarding of civil and religious rights. The political rights, which are the subject matter of these key provisions, refer to the establishment of a Jewish national home. And look at what I've underlined. In the key disposition clause, as laid down in the preamble. So come with me. We, we better look at the preamble because it's part of this key disposition clause. Next. In the preamble, look at what comes up. Do you remember what the claim involved in Paris in February? They wanted historical connection recognized for the Jewish people. They wanted what? The right to reconstitute what the Jews used to have. It's there. It's in the preamble. And the preamble is incorporated in the key article two. So the establishment of the Jewish national home is to be implemented by the mandatory power, keeping in mind the historical connection of the Jews to the Holy Land, <clears throat> keeping in mind what they used to have because they're supposed to reconstitute it. Next. I've put the three key provisions together. And when you look at those for a while, it is so obvious that the central purpose of the two first treaties is for the benefit of the inhabitants. The central purpose of the mandate for Palestine is different. It's for the establishment of a Jewish national nation, national home in Palestine. Next. Uh, I spent a lot of time in uh, the in libraries around the world, in archives, sometimes but less often in archives, but the archives of the League of Nations <coughs> in Geneva are a place that for those who, who like to read, who, who have scholarly pursuits, I please go there. It's beautiful. It's quiet and there's so much. In the archives there's a map. There's a map which is extraordinary because it, it gives so much detail. And it depicts here the three mandated territories. Next slide. And what's interesting when you look at this map in respect to Syria, Mesopotamia, or Palestine, please note this. Assigned to France, what is the disposition, what is the date where the title is given? April 25, 1920. Where will, that's the same remote decision. That's where the French get their power. They don't get it from the League. The League is a supervision institution that's supposed to carry out the intent of the decisions of the five supreme powers. Next. So, the result of San Remo, the result of these three treaties is that a large chunk of the Ottoman territories is given to the Arabs. It's not 100% of what they asked for, but the bulk of it was given to them. Palestine was supposed to be an area on both sides of the Jordan River, which went further than the map submitted by the Zionist organization in Paris. However, in 1921, some really delicate things were taking place. The French had kicked out Faisal, and uh, the Ashamite uh, family, uh, Hussein, Abdullah, uh, were going to go to war because they were so upset. That's when Churchill called a conference in Cairo and decided to, in order to placate the Arabs, to give the, the area of, of, of Iraq to Faisal, he later became king there, and to take two-thirds of what was Palestine, only referred to as Palestine in the mandate document, two-thirds of it and give it to his brother Abdullah, who became the emir and eventually king. Creates an Arab nation in Palestine. 
if you look at the documentation, it's Palestine and an Arab nation is created there. Today, when I look at all the decisions made by the Supreme Council relating to Europe, relating to the Arabs, everybody got what they were promised. All of the rights that were provided and granted and, and, and conveyed have been enjoyed, except for one people, the Jewish people, who are struggling to retain a little component of what was referred to as West Palestine. The Treaty of Lausanne, which I mention later, uh, the Allies threatened to go to war against the Turks because they were dragging their feet too much. Eventually, the Treaty of Lausanne is signed and, uh, in 1923, and the, the rights are, are given. What's interesting about this is that until 1923, Palestine was occupied territory. As an international lawyer, I can tell you this. There's nothing wrong with the concept of occupation. Occupation is what happens until the day when a final determination is made. Today, I take the position that the disputed areas, in my view, are occupied Jewish territories, not occupied allied, allied, allied territories. The, the, the key difference between Jerusalem and those territories is that the area of Jerusalem has been annexed by the government of Israel, and the only difference in the quality of the title to Jerusalem and the rest of the territories is what the government of Israel has done. If there is a weakness today in a claim in respect to the disputed territories, it's because different governments of Israel have made certain points. Concessions, I should say. League of Nations dissolved in 1946. In the final resolution, it's clear that even though the League is gone, the mandates are, are, are to be honored, that the, the, the people concerned are, are to be protected, that the sacred trust of civilization referred to in Article, Article 22 of the Covenant are supposed to be kept in mind and honored. I continue. Article 80 of the UN Charter specifies that the rights given prior to the signing of the UN Charter, are to be respected and are not to be disregarded. Rights given to the Jewish people are kept alive. They're grandfathered. They're protected by this provision of a major international treaty. The UN Charter is a treaty signed by nations. It's a source of rights and obligations. It's a source of rights for the Jewish people, Article 80. Now, having presented the basis for my conclusions that title was given to the Jewish people in respect to Palestine, the next question is, many things have happened since. Uh, have those things not taken away from what was done before? Well, partition resolution, General Assembly, 1947. It's a resolution of the General Assembly. I don't have time to go into details. General Assembly resolutions are not binding. They can be recommendations. They can be politically significant. If the partition plan had been accepted by the Arabs and the Jews back then, it could have been introduced into the terms of a treaty, which would have been a source of rights and obligations. You know what happened. The Arabs said no, there was war. Later, that resolution doesn't alter or amend in any way the rights given to the Jewish people previously. This map of the, the partition plan shows you that Jerusalem was not supposed to be part of the Arab state. It wasn't supposed to be part of the Jewish state. However, there was a clause that specified that after 10 years, if this was put in place, there would be a referendum. And it's fascinating, the number of leaders I read, whether it's Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir, and they all said the same thing. Hey, we had a majority in Jerusalem in, in 1947. Can you imagine what would happen after 10 years when the doors open? We would have a huge majority. And we'll win the referendum, and Jerusalem can be added to the Jewish state. Fascinating when you read the decision of the International Court of Justice in 2004 relating to the so-called fence or wall. No reference to the fact that Jerusalem wasn't supposed to be part of the Arab state. Strange memory. Strange way of dealing with things. Let me show you. Let's continue. Here's another one. Next slide. Here's uh, the, the key provision of the partition plan, which talks about the referendum after 10 years. 
that's so overlooked, that's so forgotten. Jerusalem was not supposed to be part of the Arab state. Next. In fact, it wasn't just Jerusalem. Bethlehem was part of the corpus separatum. Nobody talks about that anymore. It's a foregone conclusion that Bethlehem would not in the future be part of the Jewish state, but it wasn't given to the Arabs in the partition resolution. It was part of the corpus separatum. Declaration of Independence, did that somehow, that declaration negate the rights that the Jews were given in San Remo and under the mandate for Palestine? Of course not. Now let me take you to something significant. Southwest Africa, known as Namibia later. The British, when they defeated the Germans, had um, the entitlement to become mandatories there, and they conveyed their rights to South Africa. So South Africa, because of the British, becomes mandatory over Southwest Africa. You're asking yourself, how is this relevant? When the League of Nations was dissolved, South Africa basically decided to take over title, to, to assert sovereignty over Southwest Africa, resulting in a whole bunch of cases in front of the International Court of Justice. <coughs> Repeatedly, in the decision in 1950, the International Court of Justice says, just because the League of Nations is gone, doesn't take away from the validity of the mandates. I'm dealing with your question right now. OK, there was a mandate with rights for the Jewish people, but there's no longer a mandatory. So how is it relevant? The fundamental rights and terms contained in the mandate for Palestine to the extent that there's been no final determination in respect of the disputed territories, according to the ICJ, which has a viewpoint when Jews are not involved, and a different Jew viewpoint when the Jews are involved. Next. 1950. Same court. Raison d'être. Original object remains. We're talking about here the essence of what was in Article 22, the essence of what was in the mandates, the, the sacred trust of civilization. And what the UN obtained when the League left was the right to supervise the right to oversee, to take care of, but not to change the fundamental terms of the legal treaties that were done before. 1950 again. Southwest Africa still to be considered a territory held under mandate. This is in 1950. The League is gone. The court is saying the obligations set out in these mandates are still relevant. Here's 1962. The court here refers to the sacred trust of civilization, which is still pertinent. I maintain that that sacred trust of civilization, embraced by the nations, ratified by the League of Nations in 1922, is still relevant today in respect to any aspect of the territory where no final determination has been made, and certainly in regard to Jerusalem. Today, I have a document with me that uh, is, is interesting because I looked and looked and looked. You know, I've, I, I found the minutes of the St. Remo meetings. I, I discovered the villa. I was in the villa. One thing I couldn't find was a signed copy of the Mandate for Palestine. Lots of looking around at the archives in Geneva. And no signed document to be found. You can Google Mandate for Palestine, you'll find copies of it everywhere. Will you find an executed copy of that document for me? Because I'm saying it's the Magna Carta that's still relevant today. So we looked in London, because you'd think, since they were mandatories, and since they agreed to the terms of the mandate, they'd find a copy there. We looked and looked through the help of an amazing friend in Switzerland, who was determined to help me to find this. And the, we connected with the head archivist. Could not be found. We basically gave up, puzzled that such a document cannot be found anywhere. 
Later, about uh, six or seven months later, we get a package. And it's a package from the archives. In the package, sorry, is a disc. It says archives on here. She kept looking, and after looking for months and months and months, she found a signed copy. It was tucked away in an African file with Togolan, Cameroon, and East Africa. Palestine comes last. No wonder it couldn't be found. Why was it there? I now have this document, and it is signed by William Rappard. Interestingly, the founder of the institute where I defined, de defended my thesis. Rappard was the head of the Permanent Commission, Permanent Mandates Commission. He played a key role during the years when the British were diluting and taking away from the rights of the Jewish people. In 1939, when that horrible white paper was enacted, he screamed at the British saying, you're breaching, you're contravening the essence of the, the, the mandate obligations that you've accepted. Because the British played a key role in helping the Jewish Zionist movement, and yet they played a key role in interfering with the progress of that. For the rest of my life, I'll ask the question, how is it possible that even Churchill, when he was prime minister, did not nullify that kind of legislation? What would have happened to hundreds of thousands of Jewish people if, if the doors had been open for immigration between 1939 and the end of the war? Big questions. I had the opportunity to present my work in the House of Commons in, in Britain, and it's a delicate thing to say, thank you for doing so much to help the Zionist movement, but how on earth could you betray these people the, to the extent that you did? in situations like the White Paper of 1939. Nevertheless, that treaty, I have a signed copy, I can table, I can show you exactly where to find the document now. I haven't found the one in Geneva, so if one of you has got a little spare time, there are thousands of boxes relating to Palestine at the archives. It's a nice place. Go and look for it. I, I tried, and you get five boxes, let's say, and so much in there is interesting that you never get to the sixth box because there's so much good stuff in the first five. But somewhere in there, we'll find an original copy. My conclusion is this. This is a question of justice. I, I've looked at all the pertinent facts. I've looked at all the circumstances, and there's only one conclusion possible. As far as the issue of sovereignty is concerned, the decision has been made. It is res judicata. It's no longer necessary for the government of Israel, for the Jewish people, to go around the world and say, recognize our rights. The rights have been recognized. What has been recognized? The historical connection between the Jewish people and all of this land. Particularly Jerusalem, which is my focus. You have to re uh, the right to reconstitute what you used to have. How could anyone look at these rights and obligations and pretend that you can take the Jewish people out of any area of Jerusalem, in particular the old city? Is it possible to reconstitute what the Jews had in this city without the old city, when the old city was Jerusalem for 19 centuries? Of course not. So for those who are here today representing different nations, uh, I know there are diplomats here, it's a matter of conscience. I know you're probably thinking, but Dr. Gauthier, the majority doesn't agree with you. Well, the majority is wrong. In a way, I can't be too, too, too negative or judgmental because it takes a long time to put that puzzle together. And if you asked me questions uh, uh, 15, 20 years ago, I would not have given you these answers. I don't want to be too severe with the Jewish people who don't understand the significance of St. Remo, or the Israelis for that matter, because it took me a long time to get it right for the thing to crystallize. But if you look at it in a thorough, comprehensive way, this is what you will find. I am ready to deal with any issue, any question that I've addressed today. There's no other answer than the one I've given you today. The rights have been given to the Jewish people. 
And today, you don't come to me and say, well, don't you know that the right of conquest has been taken out and you, you can't conquer territory according to the right of conquest any, uh, uh, to conquest anymore? I say, I agree with you. That's international law. And Israel did acquire the territories in question through conquest in 1967. But where does it say that if you owned it before, if you got title and sovereignty before, you lose that by taking a territory through war? If you ignore the past, then you can come to that conclusion. And then they tell me, but what about Resolution 242 of the Security Council? Doesn't it negate what you've argued today? No, wait a minute. Resolution 242, Security Council, yes, it has some binding effects. But look at it as a lawyer. It's conditional. It doesn't say it's going to, that Israel will withdraw from all territories. It's going to withdraw from some territories. Provided the following conditions <coughs> are complied with. A, B, C. None of them are really complied with. If the government of Israel asks me today, do we have to withdraw now? The answer is no. No obligation legally to withdraw. You can do what you want politically, but not legally. What about self-determination, Dr. Gauthier? Don't you understand what's happened to the principles of self-determination in the 1960s, 1970s in international law? This is what counts now. You know, the, the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian leaders have been so wise. They're so good at marketing. See, what, what happened in the early 1960s is that there was a parade. It was a parade of all the former colonies trying to get rid of the heavy uh, burdens of, imposed upon them by, by European nations and others. It was time to end this colonial era. And the Palestinians rushed over and joined the parade and marched. We're a former oppressed colony, and the oppressor are the Israelis. Wait a minute. First of all, no one in international law argues that the principles of self-determination were part of international law until the 1960s, 1970s. And even now, if you put 10 lawyers around this table, international experts, they'll have different interpretation of what that law is. Is it this? Is it that? There's something. It's hard to pin it down. But there is a principle in international law that says you cannot retroactively impose any principle that's, that's, that becomes part of law today on what happened before. This is fundamental in international law. The rights given to the Jewish people protected by the international treaty called the UN Charter in Article 80, have not been nullified by whatever it is that the principle of self-determination has become. Today, I hear over and over again declarations of the Secretary General that the Jews are breaking international law. It's not true. The Jews have the right to be in this city. In fact, they have the right to be in any part of this land if they can show that they used to have something here. Because their right to the recognition of their historical link and the right to reconstitute has been recognized. Thank you.